Hello, my name is Lourdes Ramos Heinrichs, and I work in the Boston Public Schools, and I've been working in the Boston Public School for 16 years, a long time. And before the Boston Public Schools, I was working in the San Diego School District for six years. And I developed a special interest in stuttering about 16 years ago, which is the time when I received uh, my stuttering speci specialization. And it has been a wonderful experience having this uh, specialization uh, because I've been able to really make a difference in the life of so many people who stutter and their families and the teachers. I help them to understand better ways to communicate with um, students who stutter and how to help them out. And also I am a stuttering consultant for my colleagues in the Boston Public Schools. So in that job role, what I do is I go around the school districts when SLPs um, call me and ask for my assistance in helping them to understand um, assessments, how to assess a child who stutters or how to develop a stuttering program that is effective in this, um, this workshop is called Stuttering Treatment Strategies for Affective and Behavioral Roadblocks. And that is a big issue out there in the schools and people working with um, students who stutter is uh, working with the behavioral components and the social emotional components. Because many people, many SLPs before they get experience uh, working with stuttering, the big focus that they have is on the fluency shaping. So they start using certain strategies on fluency shaping, and then they come to a point where it's frustrating for them and also for the students, because it's difficult for the, the client to bring the, the fluencies to their natural environment. So my, speaking dis my speaker's disclosure is that I'm an employee of the Boston Public Schools, as I said, and I received the financial compensation from ASHA for this presentation. And my non-financial disclosure is that I have no non-financial relationships to the content of this presentation. Many persons who stutter can easily achieve speech fluency targets within the clinical setting. You can see many times when clients come and you model for them in the clinical setting easy, relaxed speech, and then suddenly they're doing it. They speak very fluently, and they start relaxing, and, and then you begin to think, oh, wow, the, the child is really making a lot of progress. And then many times it gets to the point where, where the therapist thinks, oh, this child is so fluent when I see no Flu no disfluencies at all when they come to the clinic, so they, the child must be ready or the client must be ready for dismissal or to be discharged. But we have to be careful because many clients show poor carryover to the natural environments. And often there are parents that come crying to the office saying, my child is stuttering so much, and they don't want to come to school anymore. They are struggling. And the therapist gets into this um, conflict with the parents, saying, no, your child is fluent, uh, contradicting the parent. And, and so that becomes a real conflict between the therapist and the parents. That where the therapist is seeing fluency in, in the clinic, but the parents and the teachers are not seeing the fluency, the child is breaking down in the classroom and at home. And so many clients relapse to pre-therapy levels when we make a decision to discharge them because we don't see the disfluency in the office or in the clinical setting. So um, stuttering treatment can be, a, can be complicated. It can, it can seem to be complicated, but really is very manageable in any 
speech therapist has the skills to effectively treat a client who stutters. And the components that we look at are not different from the components that you look at when you are assess assessing any child or any person that is referred for an assessment. For example, you look at the phonation, um, you look at the articulation, are there any articulation problems? Often stuttering has um, people who stutter have articulation issues as well. Some may have language issues, some may not, or you may see some, the research shows that there is a little bit of a delay in persons who stutter compared to the control populations. Uh, often, the social pragmatics in, in people who stutter is, is a big issue that needs to be looked at, um, such as how is the eye contact, how is the, the person's ability to initiate um, a conversation, end a conversation, uh, maintain a topic of conversation, listen to, to, the, to other people, um, the transition from one topic to another. So that's all social pragmatics that need to be looked at. A lot of people who started to uh, may have issues with auditory feedback. So that's something that also needs to be assessed and looked at and make a determination if that is an issue for this particular client that you have. Uh, feelings and emotions is a very important component that many times when I go to the schools to do consulting with other therapists, I often hear a therapist saying, oh, the client says that he doesn't care that he stutters or that he feels okay with it. So, and then I ask, do you, do you have any data? Do you, do you do any assessments? And they say, oh, I didn't think about doing an assessment. So I talk to them about uh, doing the, administering the, for example, the CAT, communicative um, um, assessment tool. And, and so from tools like this, you get a lot of information that is objective and you get numbers and you get data that helps you to understand the client and to understand um, what kind of um, issues they are facing with their emotions and their perceptions about themselves and their stuttering difficulty. For example, do they have a perception that other people view them or evaluate them in a negative way because of the stuttering? So we don't know that, and the client is, has difficulty revealing that information or verbalizing that information. So we need to help them communicate that information to us by administering uh, tools and questionnaires that can help them to explain those concepts that can be very difficult for them to, to us, to the clinicians. So we also look at perceptions, you know, how do, does the person who stutters, how do they, they view themselves as communicators, which is very important in the treatment of stuttering, the, the perceptions, um, their communication, in stuttering, as I imagine in any other uh, speech communication disorder, there can be a negative cycle that can develop. Uh, for example, the person might think, okay, I'm having difficulty communicating. I, I get stuck. I cannot say what I wanna say and it's embarrassing. People laugh. I, people are gonna think I'm incompetent, and then that begins to develop into self-doubt and distrust, like, oh, I wasn't able to say my name, or I wasn't able to tell my teacher that, that I needed to go to the bathroom. So, so that becomes into shame and worry because all the other kids are witnessing that difficulty. And then that begins to have more difficulty into the speech mechanism which this speech mechanism is sensitive to feelings and emotions. 
So then that begins the cycle again. So it is important to address cognitive and emotional struggles in stuttering treatment. And so there is one approach in, to deal with social, emotional, and behavioral components. There are many approaches in, in the field that, that help us, the speech therapists, to target those areas of um, therapy. For example, cognitive behavioral therapy is, um, is an approach, is a behavioral therapy approach that tell us that problems emerge through conditioning from the environment and from other stimuli. For example, when a person who stutters, they are receiving negative conditioning from their own speech and from the reaction of others, of others in, in, their, in their environment. They see mom getting embarrassed, mom getting uncomfortable with their speech, others uh, speaking for them. So that's the negative um, conditioning that is coming from the environment. When we try to do therapy for these clients, after a while of um, many experiences of negative reinforcement, then it becomes very difficult for the client to control their negative uh, feelings and behaviors through rational thought. So, So then the therapist, we have the, the job of helping the client to reestablish their positive self-esteem and their confidence in themselves. And so we, we have approaches in our field that helps us in a systematic way to help the client to change unhelpful, unhelpful thinking. Um, to a more realistic frame of mind. For example, unhelpful thinking could be, uh, I'm not going to the, to the party or to the birthday party because I'm going to stutter and that's gonna be embarrassing and the other kids are going to laugh and they're gonna think I'm incompetent. So that's a, an example of unhelpful thinking. So in the approaches that we use as therapists, uh, we are gonna help the client to develop a more realistic frame of mind. And cognitive behavioral therapy and stuttering is, is, a, is a very good way to start for many SLPs and a lot of times we feel uncomfortable dealing with counseling and often, often people, SLPs, express that, they feel that they're not trained as counselors and so they feel uncomfortable dealing and helping the clients with social and emotional uh, reactions to the stuttering. But we're gonna see in this um, presentation that we are well equipped as speech therapists to address the needs of the clients, the social emotional needs, so that they can, be, so that they can become better communicators, more comfortable with themselves. Um, so the, the concept in cognitive behavioral therapy is that conditioned fears originate from the stimulus and avoidance responses. So the avoidance response could be, um, I'm not going to the birthday party. So that's an avoidance. Or I'm not, gonna I'm not going to speak to the principal. Or I'm not going to order at the restaurant. So that's an avoidance response. And so over time, these responses, these avoidances become conditioned into fears. So become difficult to change. And so in our therapy, we want to change the maladaptive thinking um, so that we can have a, a more positive affect and behavior. So cognitive behavioral therapy is effective in reducing the social anxiety in, in adults. That's what the research has shown. And, and I can tell you from my personal experience, in children, 
you see a, a positive change in their social anxiety related to speaking in a matter of a, one or two sessions. The kids are happy and they say, oh, I didn't know that I, it's okay to feel uh, uncomfortable, that it's okay to feel nervous or to feel embarrassed. But I'm going to choose to communicate and to develop my communication skills. One thing that has to be pointed out is that cognitive behavioral therapy is, hasn't been tested so much for reducing stuttering frequency, although, although often you might see reductions in stuttering frequency when the child is able to relax, the child or the person who stutters is able to relax and feel more comfortable and more accepting of themselves and their disability. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, the objective is to decrease the cognitive distortions and to increase the mindful thinking. So mindful thinking would be, for example, um, saying to yourself, I, I am part of this community. I'm part of this classroom. What I have to say is important and it's going to be helpful to, to the other people. I'm a member of this community. So, so I'm going to go to the cafeteria with everybody. I'm going to be accepting my, the fact that I have a disability and that I'm, sometimes I'm gonna have difficulty speaking. But it's not going to be a, impacting my ability to integrate myself into my daily life into my community, my friends, my social, social setting, my family, contributing my ideas, contributing the important things that I have to say. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, the client gains control of his mind by focusing the attention to the present moment. Breathing is important. Um, often the person forgets to breathe because they're thinking so much, they're so nervous about, um, you know, that they're going to stutter or that they're going to get stuck on the T or the C or, you know, some sound. So they're so worried about that that they forget to breathe. And so they, so, so we need to teach them, right, in therapy with reali about realistic thoughts about human communication. Human com in human communication, we have a lot of errors um, and, and we have a lot of opportunities to, to s communicate and say what we want to say and to be accepted as we are and to be accepting of other people with the difficulties that they might be having in, in different areas. So we want to be able to replace the discursive thinking, the discursive thinking being, you know, all these thoughts that you might be having, you know, I'm gonna fail as a communicator, people are gonna laugh. And so you, the person begins to go into that world, internal world, and, and they forget about the present moment, you know, oh, you know, who is here? This is my, my little brother, I wonder what, if he has an issue, what, what, what does he wanna tell me? Or this is my little friend, I wonder how her weekend was. I wonder if she enjoyed herself at the field trip. So, you know, we want to bring the client outside of their mind and into the real world. What is the communication with all the imperfections that there are in it? So one tool that we can use as um, speech therapists to help the clients to communicate to us what, what issues they are facing in their daily life is uh, the clinical use of cell reports. And the SSI-4 has a very good tool, which is called the clinical use of cell reports. And this tool is used to systematically collect data at regular intervals to assess the emotional and the cognitive reactions and to provide helpful clinical information for managing a dynamic treatment plan. And, 
And often, very often, if you ask a client who stutters, how is it going? A lot of times they might say, oh, it's going okay. It's going okay. So a tool like the clinical use of self-reports is going to help the client to say, yeah, I'm having issues when I'm talking to authority figures. And then there's a scale from zero to 10. Right now, today, I was nine. I was having a lot of difficulty communicating. I was having a lot of repetitions. I was having secondary behaviors when I was trying to talk to my mother or to a teacher or someone in authority. Uh, so, but without this tool, the client might not be able to communicate. They might just say, oh, it's going okay. How is it going? It's going okay. So we don't have a way. We are, the, this tool is giving a, the client um, a system, a way to be able to express what they are experiencing in the real world. And so in this tool, for example, in the clinical use of self-report, uh, the client communicates their perceived stuttering severity. How severe am I when I'm talking to uh, my friends? Maybe I'm very fluent when talking to my friends. What about when talking to more challenging audiences, like maybe uh, the police officer or the secretary in the, in the office, or when giving a presentation in the class? How am I? Like maybe maybe you are very fluent in one setting and very disfluent in another setting. So this tool is helping the client to communicate in what settings are the more challenging. And also this tool is uh, helping the client to express the extent of the internal and external locus of control. How much do they feel that they have control of their speech? Is it like something that is just happening, the disfluency is just happening, and they have no control what is making it happen, or is it the, the, the sight of an authority figure, or the sight of the principal, or the sight of the parent that is determining the level of fluency, or is it internal? Do I need to control my body? I need to relax. I need to breathe, I need to focus on what, I, on what I'm saying and on the communication. So that's the, the level, you know, how much control uh, is, is, uh, apply, is, um, is, that is coming from the client versus the control that is coming from outside forces. So the avoidance is too. The client naturally is not going to tell you, oh, you know, I was, having difficulty ordering in a restaurant. But it, when, you give, when you give them the, the questionnaire, the self-report, they can tell you specific information that can be very helpful in the clinical setting and in addressing the specific needs that the client has. And I'm talking about the, uh, the clinical use of self-reports. But there are many. The one in the SSI-4 is a very helpful one, and it's very thorough, and it explains each one of the items, the areas that are being targeted. And so, for example, in the clinical use of self-reports in the SSI-4, each item in the scale assists the client in communicating to the clinician, their feelings, their fears, their avoidances, and other emotional struggles related to the stuttering and the impact on daily interactions. For example, this is, this is one page in the clinical use of self-reports, and it demonstrates the data that was collected is over three sessions. So there was session one, session two, and session three. And the most affected area we can see in the data is uh, communicating with strangers and authority figures. And the least affected area is communicating with family members and close friends. So when we look at this data, we might want to look at what is the client doing when communicating with the family members. Maybe they are more relaxed. Maybe they're breathing better. Maybe they are 
more open to listening to what they are saying. So, so we need to look at what strategies the client is using that makes them to feel more relaxed uh, with family members. And then we can carry those skills or those strategies and apply them to the, uh, to the most affected areas, such as communicating with strangers and authority figures. So many of the skills that we need to use for communicating are very similar. You know, taking, relaxing, listening to others, having eye contact, responding to question, uh, questions, asking questions. So sim very similar skills that can be transferred from a more comfortable setting and, and more and easier um, audiences to more difficult and more challenging audiences. So in this data, you can see that over three sessions, there is a marked decline in each one of the areas being measured. And, and as we can see with the authority figure, this particular client was having the most difficulty communicating. And, they, and he was, this client was rating himself very high, indicating that he was having the most difficulty communicating with the authority figures. So in addition to finding out what the client is doing, what skills they are using to communicate with easier audiences, also the therapist can obtain resources from books or stuttering programs. For example, the Stuttering Foundation has great resources that can help the therapist to help the client to express and communicate um, feelings and emotions with challenging audiences. So you can obtain resources from the Starwin Foundation. And also the Google, you can uh, Google um, how to talk to authority figures. And there is many, much, much, there is a lot of information in the internet that you can look at and see if it's applicable to your particular client. So in one approach that is used and that is gaining popularity uh, to deal and to, to help clients to understand and to deal with their difficult social emotional components of stuttering is the solution-focused brief therapy. And the solution-focused brief therapy is um, the, there is a video uh, that the Stuttering Foundation of America has with Francis Cook and Willie Botterelli from England, and they explain in great detail, um, and, and they try to coach the therapists that are viewing the video on becoming more competent in using the solution-focused brief approach uh, to help the, the client to feel more comfortable on themselves and to develop their own solutions and their own coping mechanisms to their situation. The solution-focused therapy approach has five key questions that you address in therapy. So I have a very good um, handout that is called the solution-focused brief therapy. And in this handout, I explain in detail uh, the history behind this approach. And I give uh, um, a lot of examples for each one of the components, for each one of the five components, on what kind of questions to ask um, so that you can help the client to start developing their own solution to their own problems. And so these are, in this um, solution-focused brief therapy handout, you can practice, you can take some of the uh, questions if they're applicable, but th those are example questions that you can use to help you develop your own questions uh, in your own therapy. So the, for example, the miracle, there are five questions, five quick key questions. One is the miracle question, the scaling questions, exception seeking questions, coping questions, and problem free talk. 
So for example, this uh, data that I have here is based on a real client. And I was applying the solution-focused brief therapy approach. And so in the miracle question I asked, what might be the small change that you might see when you feel um, that you are being more fluent? And then he answered, I would not feel as tight. The chest would be relaxed when talking. So right here you can see that this is important to the client is not to feel as tight on the chest area. So this is data that you can take and use it to help the client to achieve that particular goal. And the scaling question is, uh, for example, from zero being no confidence to 10 being having the best confidence, how would you rate your position when talking to strangers? And so this, this client said on a bad day is three. Why? Because they will give me weird looks. My confidence is lowest when I'm tired and lacking sleep, but I would aim to attend. So again, here you, the client is giving you a lot of very important information that you can use in helping them to achieve their goals. The third question is exception seeking questions. And in, in this, um, to my, I asked my client, can you explain why the problem is less severe or absent at times? And his answer was, I work on being more calm, think of others, breathe. So again, here you are given, you're getting information from the client as to what is it that they feel that they need to do and that they are ready to start working on. So this particular client of mine was ready to learn strategies to calm, to become more calm and more relaxed and to think of others, so, so to stop thinking about their own struggle in communication and think about others, you know, which is also another key point, another key concept, a key skill that you can take to help the client. How, how do you help clients to think of others? And in, in the field of speech and, um, speech and language therapy, we have the pragmatic approach, social language. We have a lot of resources that can help us in this area in helping clients to communicate um, more effectively with others and how to breathe. You know, that's part of uh, what we know as therapists. We know how to do that really well. And so we can help our clients how to breathe and how to relate that to our speech so we can, we can have better speech with better breathing. And then the fourth question is a coping question. How do you manage to participate in life? And the answer is, it's all about my goals. I'm ambitious and I don't wanna be held back by the stutter. So here again, it's giving you ideas that the client is ready and motivated and excited to participate in life. So this is very important for you to effectively be able to help the client to make those links and those transitions and achieve the goals that they want for themselves. So in summary, effective treatment in therapy is multifactorial and is based on the needs identified during evaluation cycles. Very important to continually evaluate and provide the, uh, the questionnaires to the client to help you communicate what they are feeling, what they are experiencing. As a, another handout that I have for you is um, something that is like the clinical use of self-reports, but I generated this one that, to make it easier to use in the clinical setting at the beginning, and you can use this as an option, or you may use the one from the uh, SSI-4, which is the one that I presented here in this um, talk. The, the handout that I present is, co I call it Feelings, Emotions, Self-Assessment Report for Stuttering. So again, I have a lot of different um, questions that the client can, um, can answer to communicate to you, or a lot of different statements, about 22 statements that the client can use to help you communicate what they are experiencing in their, in their life so that you are able to help them with those particular issues that are very personal to them. Also, it's, it's important to remember that beliefs, thoughts, and cognitive distortions affect therapy outcomes. 
And that's a very important part of the speech therapy with persons who stutter is to address, to find out what, what they believe about communication. What are their thoughts and, and their cognition and their feelings, their affective components of stuttering and address those. And the cognitive and emotional struggles must be addressed in therapy for, in order for the client to be satisfied and to have um, positive results from therapy. It's very important not to, not to neglect the cognitive and the emotional struggles. And so in this, um, in my handouts, I'm giving you two tools, which is the solution focus brief therapy um, uh, handout, and also the feelings, emotions, self-assessment report, which you can use to help you understand what the client needs at this particular moment in time. Um, clinical self-reports help communicate feelings, fears, avoidances, and other behavioral struggles to the therapist. As we said before, the clients who stutter, even adults, have a very difficult time verbalizing w what is it that is bothering them, or why is it that they're having avoidances, or why are they feeling so, so many fears in communicating, or why do they perceive negative reactions so that they are feeling negative, being, that they are being negatively evaluated by others. So all of these are behavioral struggles that are communicated to the therapist so that you can help the client. And so the solution-focused brief therapy approach is, is one approach that can help the client to envision a better future. 